In a world where semi-automatic rifles are banned, what's a gunfighter to do? That's what we're going to talk about, this thought experiment. Some of you, like me, may have been old enough to have lived through the assault weapons ban, the last one. It's right here in America not that long ago. Arguably, America's most popular rifle was banned. And not just in California or New Jersey, but nationwide. What if something like that happened again? What if it was even worse, where pretty much all semi-automatic rifles were banned? This thought experiment is what we're going to discuss today on Gunfighter Life. The podcast where we talk about guns and gun fighting the right way, with Judeo-Christian values and real-world first-hand experience. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. With that, I'll put in the bio and we'll get into the main topic. So, who am I? Who is this person talking to you from across the internet? Why should you listen? First and foremost, I am a Christian, a servant of God, and a follower of Jesus Christ. God has blessed me to do many things in my life, for I could do nothing apart from him. U.S. Marine Corps combat veteran, did a couple of tours in Iraq. As an assaultman after my combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. Also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also did several years in law enforcement, LAPD. I worked regular assignments and more specialized assignments. Been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency. That's all I'll say about that. Been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion. And West Coast Regional Rifle Champion. One more shooting competitions with the talent that God's given me than I can actually remember. Was blessed to be the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. Our primary job, the reason we primarily existed, was to stop active shooters. I got the opportunity to head up and be the commander of that team. I grew up around guns, hunting and shooting, and competing at a very early age. Been blessed to hunt all over this beautiful country from Whitetail on the East Coast to Mule on the West Coast and bear and elk and all manner of things. I've even been a professional big game hunter and guide. But again, most importantly, I'm a Christian. And I am your host, Michael Melito. Welcome to the podcast. Now you might surmise because I'm the host of Gunfighter Life and I have made my life by God's grace in this world with a Bible and a gun one way or another pretty much the vast majority of my adult life that I would be married to the AR, the SCAR-17 whatever the case may be but I'm not I'm a warrior like David a mighty warrior after God's own heart and I'll be a warrior with or without guns if you take my guns away I'll train with a bow and arrow you take that away I'll train with sticks and stones and I'll still be By God's grace, hopefully always, a righteous man of God and a mighty warrior. Guns are simply a way to project force, to change somebody's behavior that needs to be changed. And although I'm not certainly not for it, I could certainly see a future where ARs are banned, where semi-automatic rifles are banned. Again, it wasn't that long ago that they were banned. And I hope the day never comes. But for a thought experiment, because thought experiments can be useful... Let's look at what are some good options if semi-automatic rifles are banned. Right off the bat, I will tell you if the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan, you've probably heard this before. My go-to long gun is not going to be a semi-automatic rifle. It's not going to be a rifle at all. It's going to be a shotgun. Nothing rivals its versatility for putting food on the table and for personal defense, in my opinion. And that's likely what you tune in for. But I still see the need for rifles. I still have go-to rifles in certain circumstances. Like if if it's just not carte blanche, but I have other circumstances, I would grab a rifle. Likely my SCAR-17. But let's say that semi-automatic rifles are banned. So right away I would go to the shotgun. Even when the assault rifle ban was in place, semi-automatic shotguns were not affected. You could get semi-automatic shotguns. Even right now in California, you can run semi-automatic shotguns. And let's go even further. Let's say semi-automatic shotguns are banned this time. Pump action shotgun. When I go to drive through California, whatever, pump action shotgun. They can think all that they want and let them think. 
that black rifles are more dangerous because a pump action shotgun is for almost all survival and defensive scenarios a better tool for the job so just choose it what's that great quote from the count of monte cristo let neglect become our ally they're so focused on this this seemingly dangerous ar-15 that shoots a varmint bullet when you we can be rocking a 12 gauge with double all buck or slugs but let's not cheat so let's assume that you want a rifle semi-automatic rifles are banned and you want a rifle because when you want a rifle that's it's a pretty specific tool you want to project force farther or want more precise shooting up close and again let's not make some frankenstein rifle like an ar where the magazine doesn't come out and all this other stuff let's talk about legit all semi-autos this time are banned so semi-autos are off the table semi-automatics of any kind sadly Includes pistol caliber carbines, semi-automatic long guns of any kind. Well, in my mind, this avenue kind of bifurcates. There's a fork in the road. You can go down the one of two roads. You can go down the lever action pistol caliber carbine road. Or you can go down the full power bolt action rifle road. Let's first take the fork that leads down the... Lever action, rifle, road. Lever actions are great. They've been around a long time. They're often referred to as the redneck assault rifle. They can give you quite a fast rate of fire. Especially if this was going to be your go-to defensive carbine. Go look at, like, cowboy action. It would be sad if restrictions or regulations knocked us back 150 years. But, again, it would not cause me to have a heart attack if, I, if that happened. I would submit the most versatile of these to to fill the most roles is going to be a lever action 357 slash 38 special. Much like in revolvers, you got to be careful with bullet seat depth and stuff. But most 357 magnum lever actions will also feed 38 special and fire 38 special. So you get the duality of cartridges there. You can go very mild wad cutter, semi wad cutter, just straight lead. If you reload, very, very affordable. And if you're getting into reloading and you own one, probably the one I would start with and the easiest cartridge in my experience ever to reload for is 38 Special. Use a real voluminous powder. That way you don't put several charges because a 38 Special case, you can fit several charges in. Get something that takes up some space so you can look down and decipher how many charges if you happen to double charge a load. It's a real thing. It really happens. Getting a little bit off topic. 38 Special is great. It's a great small and medium small game round. It's a great training round. It's cheap and easy to manufacture. And 38 Special is, in a handgun, a good defensive caliber. In a long gun, you just pick up even more and more velocity. You pick up quite a bit more power in that longer barrel. If you don't know how that works, just think of it like this. For all practical purposes, could get outside these simple parameters. But for simplicity's sake, when a bullet leaves the barrel, there's some percentage of unburnt powder. The longer that barrel is, the less percentage of unburnt powder there is. Therefore, the more powder burns in the barrel, the higher the velocity. The more of that potential energy gets transferred into kinetic energy, the longer the barrel. And you can get a barrel so long that that's not the case. But for most practical cartridges and rifles and handguns, that is the case. So you put that 357 in a rifle length, even if it's a fairly short rifle, 16 inches, you get quite a big bump up in power and velocity. A lot of these will hold several rounds in the tube, and since they're not usually detachable box magazines, if that's another legislative hurdle, it won't be for this. They're great. 38 Special 357, and especially in a long gun, recoil is not unmanageable. It's not so much that you couldn't, I would say, get back on target in the amount of time it takes to cycle the bolt. It's really a sweet spot for these. With proper bullet construction, it's a fine medium game harvesting tool 357 magnum with something like 158 grain soft point bullet out of a carbine fantastic deer round especially at reasonable ranges you live east of the mississippi you live in the in the green mountains of the northeast or in the cypress swamps of the southeast places like that fantastic choice for hunting a viable self-defense cartridge very versatile 
Very good choice. If you want to bump it up, if you say, I primarily want to hunt, I want a little bit more power than that, hogs, deer, maybe even elk. I want to stay with the lever action PCC, but I may also have to use it for defense. You never know. Then you step up to the 44 mag. Now the 44 mag will also shoot 44 special, but unless you, unless you reload, in general, 44 special is not really that much cheaper. And it's usually even harder to find than 44 mag. So you don't get as much versatility there with the 44 mag. It's plenty powerful enough for pretty much anything in the lower 48. I would say it, it is powerful enough for anything in the lower 48 for sure with proper bullet construction at reasonable ranges. And there's other options here. 45 long colt I had once a Winchester Trapper and 45 long colt that I sold with a couple of other guns to fund the SCAR-17 long ago. And I don't regret that. The SCAR-17 has been a very practical, useful rifle for me professionally as a gunfighter. But that was a sweet rifle. 45 long colt, especially if you hand load again, a lot of versatility there. But really 38 special, 357 and 44 mag are your big options there and good choices. Now staying on the lever action train here, but going a little bit up the power tracks kind of back in vogue it's kind of the fanny pack of the last couple of years i think in lever actions the 4570 the old warhorse it is certainly capable of taking anything on the planet period it has a lot of power so if that is what you're looking for 4570 might be your ticket right I don't think it's nearly as versatile, but if you don't care about versatility and you just want a powerful, beefy lever action gun, you want a classic caliber, classic cartridge, 4570. The original loadings for that are fairly mild for a long gun. They're still pretty powerful, but you can get pretty crazy with modern, strong action lever action rifles and load them pretty hot. But if you want to stay on that kind of straight walled, traditional lever action caliber, you can go there. And if you want to get away from that, that's kind of an in-between, and go to traditional lever action rifle calibers. 3030 is an amazingly versatile and awesome round. It's been killing deer and elk for well over 100 years. Still a fine cartridge to do so. The Marlin 336 and Winchester 94s are awesome guns. They've been awesome for decades. They continue to be awesome. And there is no reason why they wouldn't be a good choice for this world where you cannot have a semi-automatic rifle. If you want a little bit more range, think of it as a short-range cartridge today, but not long ago that 3030 was at the top of the game for long-range shooting. And I would submit out to 200 yards. It's great. If you want something with a little bit more range than the 44 Mag 357 and even flatter trajectory than the 4570 to kill deer and elk, and a common cartridge that's got a very good reputation, 3030. Just because it's old doesn't mean it's not great. It's classic, it's practical, it's powerful, it's commonly available in lever action rifles, it's awesome. Now, these are kind of the classic, what we think of lever actions. There are a new class, and by new I think these started out in the 1950s with the BLR, so you know where I'm going if I say BLR. Box Magazine Fed modern full power rifle rounds browning blr you can get it in 308 if you wanted an all-around rifle yeah it's not a semi-automatic but you get a fast rate of fire detachable box magazine 308 you can get it in a bunch of other calibers too i just went with 308 but 30 out six you can even get it in 300 win mag 300 winchester short mag awesome option and recently we see a another version of this came out very recently the the Henry came out with their version of this and the Long Ranger. So if that kind of appeals to you, you may look at that. You may look at those platforms. This would be a viable option if you want that 308 performance. You can get it in a lever action gun. Now I'm going to mention this as we transfer to the other side of the road here because they're not lever actions, but a similar concept, pump actions. There are and have been pump action 38 Special 357s. Pretty cool handy little rifles if you just prefer a slide action pump action to lever action there's a lot of reasons for that and if you want it in a full power rifle cartridge a really underappreciated and 
awesome crossover for hunting and defensive use, and just a great weapon. The Remington 76, 760, and 7600. Pump action, 30 out 6 motion most popular by far chambering in that rifle I think but you can get it in 308 and 243 and all kinds of cool calibers but you know obviously World War One and World War, World War Two showed us that 30 out 6 is a quite effective defensive offensive combat cartridge and you can use even better bullets than were available back then so certainly capable Remington 7600 pump action fantastic fantastic gun now, there's probably a subsection out there. I know of at least one that's an avid listener and supporter of the show, and I'm very thankful to all the patrons, but he's going to say, there's a rifle built specifically for this, like this whole thing you're talking about. It's called the Scout Rifle, and I would agree this would be a place where the Scout Rifle might be your go-to choice, and you might really look at the Scout Rifle for this. It's supposed to be kind of a do-it-all rifle. Usually in 308, bolt action, handy, lightweight, good for snap shooting, practical rifle backup iron sights which i'm all about styre probably your quintessential one and then second to that the ruger gun sight scout rifle and many others that have either been turned into scout rifles or are labeled as scout rifles but a bolt action handy robust rugged 308 and you don't have to get married to 308 you get in 6.5 creed more or something similar Especially in an accurate bolt-action platform, you can really ring out the accuracy. A good, capable, reasonable rate of fire, detachable box magazine. Scout rifle. These are classically mounted with a forward-mounted optic, although I think the LPVO is just as good an option today. But a good, light, handy bolt-action rifle, and let's say the Ruger Gunsight Scout or the Steyr, with a good... LPVO optic or a good scout scope. If you don't know, a scout scope is mounted forward. Much more eye relief. There's a couple of reasons for this. I'm not going to get into that, but it lends itself to quick handy shooting, but I would consider more practical shooting. Anyway, these rifles, a scout rifle, is kind of in this arena, and this would be a, a world, sad as it might be, where semi-autos are banned, where this rifle really might shine. Quite a good hunting rifle, even today, even when you can have other rifles. Like, it's a good choice for a hunting rifle. The Steyr Scout rifle, in particular, has a lot of really, really cool features. And even though it's fairly old today, it still looks space age. I'll be honest, I kind of think they're ugly, but they handle really well. The other day, I was at a gun store and they had one, and I picked it up and I thought, it's a very homely looking gun, but I picked it up. And it handled just really well. It, it was just. And it felt like it came alive in my hands. It was a very handy rifle. And I like beautiful guns, but I like practical guns. And it's a very practical gun. It's got a lot of really cool features. You store an extra magazine in the buttstock. That's really cool. Built-in bipod. That's pretty cool. Threaded barrel. Way ahead of its time. Lightweight, handy. I think sub 7 pounds. And if you wanted a more intermediate round, you might go to what I would refer to as a light scout. The scout community may have their own vernacular for this they would maybe say it's not a scout at all a scout's got to be 308 but they make these similar guns like mossberg mvp and stuff a similar concept in 223 556 so if you want a 556 if you want to stick with that caliber you may look at this platform give it some real consideration other than the scouts i'm going to stick with practical bolt action rifles talking about a practical defensive hard times tool ruger made a really cool rifle you're probably familiar with the All Weathers. They make a really classic 30 out 6 hunting version. Well, they made one in 762 by 39 I think that would be a fantastic choice to get that. Tap it for iron sights. It comes ready for a scope, so put an LPVO on it. It'd be a fantastic all-around gun. And I don't think I have to say on this podcast, you probably know enough to know that the 762 by 39 the AK round, has plenty of street cred when it comes to being an effective intermediate cartridge. So you may really want to look at that platform if that's something you're interested in. They don't make them anymore. Everything seems, well not everything, but most, the big majority of the market seems to be towards this really long range precision shooting. But that's a good practical rifle and they're still available on the used market if you can dig one up or see one. Also, I don't know if you would consider it a mini scout, but CZ, they don't make it anymore, but the 527. Cool rifle, came in 223 and 762 by 39 iron sights, 
a light handy rifle. Also their new version of that, kind of, and it's a little bit more tactical looking, the CZ600 Trail. It's kind of this light handy chassis gun in I believe both 223 and 762x39. Cool little handy bolt gun, modular, has that kind of chassis system. And on that recently I kind of said I couldn't really think of a good practical purpose for the SIG Cross. Like, Not that it's a bad rifle, but for what? In this thought experiment where you can't have a semi-auto but you still want all the ergos and the rail attachments and you want to put a light on it and you're just familiar with the handling and the pistol grip and everything of an AR, the SIG Cross wouldn't be a bad choice for that. You're starting to get into the kind of that specialty precision rifle world, but that SIG Cross is not very heavy. And as long as you don't attach too much junk to it, it'll still be a manageable rifle. Would it be my first choice for a defensive rifle? No, I'd want a semi-automatic. But in this world where we can't have a semi-auto, the SIG Cross maybe makes more sense there. And I'm going to give you two other options. I'm going to, let's call it the baller option. Like you just got tons of money. You want the super cool, nicest of the nice. Blazer R8. It's a really nice, fast handling, straight pull rifle. Really common in Europe for shooting, running game. It's made for a more dynamic, kind of driven hunt style. But I think it will be a great choice here. Con is they're very expensive. I'm not saying they're not worth it. They're a fine rifle, but the Blazer R8, if you just, money is not really a concern for you, that'd be great. And let's go to the complete other end of the spectrum. You're pinching pennies. You're trying to, you think things might go south and you're trying to save up money to some food and things like that. The M44, the Mosin Nagant carbine. Now the regular Mosin Nagant is pretty big and heavy and bulky. There's no doubt it was an effectively used combat rifle, but it's really big and heavy. The M44 is a more manageable size. So the Mosin Nagant carbine, they're not, you know, sub $100 like they used to be, but if you're on a budget and you're looking for a good robust kind of practical rifle for defense for hunting kind of a crossover survivalist rifle if you're on a budget the m44 wouldn't be a bad choice now what would i choose if i had to pick one of these options like i couldn't have the scar 17 as my go-to peanut butter and chocolate hitting the fan rifle i couldn't even train with it day to day you know semi-automatic rifles were banned whatever the case may be I would probably go with the Scout Rifle. I probably wouldn't mount it with a Scout Scope, but I'd probably mount it with an LPVO. Although, you know what? I might mount it with a Scout Scope. I haven't really... I've only played with a Scout Scope once, like actually using it. But I'd probably go with a Scout Rifle. I think it's it's good for what it was intended to be, a good all-around rifle. Good, certainly out to 300 yards, which is... You know, if you're shooting a target, I'm not saying it's never possible, but for almost all practical scenarios, it's going to handle defensive use. It's a full-powered, proper rifle cartridge, 308, And for the kind of hunting that I do especially, 300 yards is plenty. 300 yards is great. I can hunt anything in the lower 48 with that. So assuming I'm in the lower 48... I think the Scout Rifle would be the way to go. If I had to pick one, I would probably pick a Ruger Gunsight Scout. That's just personal preference. I see a lot of merit to the Steyr. It's a fine gun. I like controlled round feed. That's just a personal preference of mine. I also like the safety style, that three position side safety. Just for the way that I hunt and the way I tend to get in sticky situations. I like that design, both the push feed and that three position safety. It's just personal preference. My second choice would probably be the Steyr. It's a great rifle. Anyway, hopefully a thought experiment we never have to live out. I hope that there is never another assault weapons ban in this country. But if it does happen, at least maybe now you have a better plan of how to proceed. Or maybe, I'm not a gun collector, but maybe you are. Maybe you want a gun like this just in case. Because if this does something like this does get passed imagine all these kind of practical rifles that aren't semi-auto are going to skyrocket in price for a while so maybe it's worth having one in your arsenal or maybe it's worth having one in your arsenal right now for when you travel somewhere like california california has some fantastic hunting options especially northern california 
Maybe you want a vehicle rifle that has to be unloaded. Yeah, but if something goes down while you're in California, at least you have one. You know, there's practical reasons for this right now. Maybe you live in a place where you you either got to have some kind of Frankenstein AR. That's an AR kind of in name only, but it's been neutered so much. You really got to think, is it actually more practical than a good bolt action rifle or a good lever action 357? There's places like that right now, and I'm not familiar with all the laws. Maybe there's some legit workarounds, but California, New York, New Jersey, Maryland. Maybe it doesn't become another nationwide thing, another nationwide assault weapons. Ban, but maybe your state goes that way, sadly. Maybe this will be useful to you ahead of time or post-event. Anyway, it's a fun thought experiment, if even a sad one. What are the best rifle options when you can't have a semi-auto? Now, those are my thoughts. Hopefully, you enjoyed this episode of Gunfighter Life. If you enjoy this content because you think it's got some value to it, I hope that you'll consider stepping up and becoming a patron, mostly because you believe and want to support the podcast. But also, patrons do get some pretty cool insider content. I've been doing a series, Dry Fire with Melito. That's me, Michael Melito, where I give some tips and tricks that I've learned over the years, some technique on how to become a better shooter. And there's a lot of other insider-only content on Patreon. Also, a lot of these episodes that tend to be longer or what I think are more substantial, I'll give them to Patreon members early and without ads. And that's quite frequent. Anyway, I hope you'll consider supporting the podcast and becoming a patron. If you have it in your heart to give, give. And if not, don't feel guilty about it. With that, the tactical tip of the day. Some of you may be real familiar with this. I don't often mention a product. But I recently tried out a Rhodesian sling. And not just because I have a Rhodesian Ridgeback, who's awesome, Alexander Hamilton. No, the Rhodesian sling seemed like a good viable concept. I have many, many years of shooting with slings. This is kind of a different thing. And without getting too technical, because this is an audio format, maybe not the best, but you put your arm in there and it goes against the top of your tricep and give some tension when you're shooting offhand, kneeling, things like that. It's a pretty cool concept. It has merit. I have been using them, trying them out. So if you're looking for a practical rifle setup like this, a practical sling setup might be a Rhodesian sling. There's also what's called a Ching sling, which requires two sling attachment points, but a lot of rifles don't have that. The Rhodesian sling, you can get that with most rifles that have just a regular two sling swivel stud attachment. Anyway, check out the Rhodesian sling. It's a pretty cool concept. You'll find in the book of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, except for Jesus, the wisest man who ever walked this earth. He says at the end of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So probably pretty important to pay attention. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Thanks for listening, and have a blessed day.